Welcome back, I'm Dr. Dai, and we are gonna jump into the second section of chapter eight, the laws of inheritance. All right, quick reminder in case it's been a little bit since you watched the previous video. Uh, Mendel studied seven characteristics in pea plants, um, and each of those uh, characteristics demonstrated or expressed one of two traits. And we'll refresh our you know, flower color, height, flower position, seed texture, seed color, things like that. He deduced from his results that each individual had two discrete copies of the characteristics that were passed individually to offspring. We now call those, um, we now call those copies genes, right? Um, and those genes are carried on chromosomes. Uh, the reason we have two copies of each gene is that we inherit one from each parent. Uh, in fact, it, it's the chromosomes that we inherit, right? Um, and the two copies of each gene are located on paired chromosomes. So chromosome one, you get one from your mom, you get one from your dad. The same genes are present on each of those chromosomes, okay? Um, so think back to meiosis where uh, those chromosomes are separated into the haploid gametes, right? Um, this separation or segregation, sometimes called, um, of homologous chromosomes also means that only one of the copies of the gene gets moved to the gamete. Um, the offspring are formed when one gamete unites with one from the other parent, and the two copies of each gene and chromosome are restored, right? So we have that haploid, meats that then fuse and then we end up with a diploid zygote yeah all right so for cases in which a single gene controls a single characteristic um, a diploid organism has two genetic copies uh, that may or may not encode the same version of that characteristic so for example one individual may carry a gene that determines white flower color and a gene that determines violet or purple flower color um, gene variations that arise by mutation, um, or excuse me, gene variations that arise by mutation and exist at the same uh, relative locations on homologous chromosomes are called alleles. Okay, so one allele is purple, violet, um, the other allele is white. The trait is flower color. Hopefully that helps. Um, Mendel explained, or excuse me, Mendel examined the inheritance of genes with just two allele forms, so just two versions of the trait. Um, but it's common to encounter more than two um, for any given gene. And it's also common for a physical characteristic to be uh, determined by more than one gene acting together. So some of this gets a lot more complicated, but we're going to stick with um, some nice examples where it's a single gene controls a single characteristic and those characteristics are limited to two versions. Okay. Um, two alleles for a given gene in a diploid organism are expressed and interact to produce a physical characteristic. The observable trait expressed by an organism uh, is referred to as its phenotype. Okay, phenotype. That's the thing you see. Okay. Um, I like to think like when I see pheno, photo, um, I, I realize it's not photo, but kind of, you know, like it's what you're seeing. Um, an organism's underlying genetic makeup, it consists of both the physical, physically visible and the non-expressed allele. We call that the genotype. So genotype is the thing on your chromosomes, right? Your genotype is what you, what the actual allele is, the trait is on each of your chromosomes. And um, what you see in the organism is the phenotype. Um, Mendel's hybridization experiments demonstrate the difference between phenotype and genotype very nicely. So for example, seed color is governed by a single gene with two alleles. The yellow seed allele is dominant and the green seed allele is recessive. Uh, when true breeding plants were cross fertilized, in which one parent has yellow seeds, true breeding yellow seeds, and the other has true breeding green seeds, the F1 generation is going to have all yellow seeds, right? Because yellow is dominant. Um, so when you then, um, 
breed that F1 generation, let them self-pollinate, you're going to re you're going to see the reemergence of green seeds in that F2 generation. Okay. Um, diploid organisms that are homozygous for a gene have two identical alleles, one on each of their homologous chromosomes. So genotype is often written as two, either two capital letters, like uh, YY here, that's homozygous dominant, if we're talking about seed color, or little y, little y, which would be homozygous recessive. Um, little y, little y is green. The phenotype is green. Capital Y, capital Y, the homozygous dominant, is yellow. Um, so the dominant allele is always capitalized, and the recessive allele is always lowercase. This becomes important if you are trying to write out genotypes, and you don't clearly distinguish between how you write your letters. <laughs> so um, keep, keep that in the back of your mind. Um, okay, the letter used for the gene, seed color in this case, is usually related to the dominant trait. So in this case, the yellow allele, so a Y. Um, Mendel's parental pea plants um, always bred true because both produce gametes the same allele. Okay, what do I mean by that? True breeding plants are homozygous either homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. That's what makes them true breeding. So if you breed two homozygous dominant plants together, all of their offspring will be homozygous dominant, okay? All right, when the P generation plants with contrasting traits, so homozygous dominant and a homozygous recessive are cross fertilized, the offspring are all going to be what's called heterozygous meaning that they possess one copy of the dominant trait and one copy of the recessive trait. So their, uh, their genotype will now be capital Y, little y, heterozygous. Um, okay, so say it out one more time. So the F1 yellow plants, right? F, so F or P, P generation, one parent, they were yellow, the other parent was green. Okay, green seeds. Um, in F1, the all of the offspring from the parental generation are all, they all have yellow seeds. When we then allow crossbreeding of F1 in F2, we now see a mixture of homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive um, seeds. All right. Okay. So, our discussion of homozygous and heterozygous organisms brings us to why the F F1 heterozygous offspring uh, were identical to one of the parents rather than expressing both alleles. So in all seven P plant characteristics, one of the two contrasting alleles was dominant and the other was recessive. Um, Mendel called the dominant allele the expressed unit factor. And the recessive allele was referred to as the latent unit factor. He didn't he didn't use um, re, he didn't use recessive that's the word that we use anyway. Um, we now know that these so-called unit factors so he was referring to um, are actually genes on homologous chromosomes. Bear in mind, Mendel knew nothing about genes or chromosomes. Okay, the, those were things that came along, describing them clearly, knowing what their structures were. That came later, so that's why he referred to them as units. Um, for a gene that's expressed in a dominant and recessive pattern, um, homozygous dominant and heterozygous organisms will look identical. You can't distinguish between the two. So they have a different genotype, but their phenotype is the same. Um, the recessive allele will only be observed in homozygous recessive individuals. Uh, Mendel's Law of Dominance states, that in a heterozygote, one trait will conceal the presence of another trait of the same characteristic. So for example, when crossing true breeding violet purple flowered plants with true breeding white flowered plants, all of the offspring were purple flowered, even though they had one allele for violet and the other allele was for white. And this Mendel's experiments have been confirmed um, using uh, genetics, like using um, our ability to uh, sequence DNA now. All right, let's get into um, how we're going to 
approach some examples. So when fertilization occurs between two true breeding parents that differ by only one characteristic being studied, um, the process is called a monohybrid cross and the resulting offspring are called monohybrids. Uh, Mendel performed seven types of monohybrid crosses, each involving contrasting traits for different characteristics, right? Those are seven characteristics. Out of these crosses, all of the F1 offspring had the phenotype of one of the parents, and the F2 offspring had a three to one phenotypic ratio. Uh, three that possessed the dominant um, version of the characteristic to every one that had the recessive. Um, the results of Mendel's research can be explained mathematically in terms of probabilities. All right. So we can, we can do this. We can work it out um, using something called a Punnett square. So to prepare a Punnett square, all possible combinations of the parental alleles, the genotypes um, of the gametes, are listed along the top for one parent and the side for the other parent of a grid. All right. The combinations of egg and sperm gametes are then made in the boxes. Um, let's see. Oh, all my, not all my lines are showing up. Well, we'll, we'll work through it in just a second. Um, let's see. Um, so each box is going to represent um, the diploid genotype of a zygote um, or a fertilized egg. All right. Uh, because each possibility is equally likely, genotypic ratios can be determined from a Punnett square. Uh, if the pattern of inheritance, dominant and recessive, is known, um, the phenotypic ratios can be inferred as well. In this case, only one genotype is possible in the F1 generation. All offspring are going to be big Y, little y, and have yellow seeds. Okay, so let's, let's take a look. So we have, you know, we're going to put first our... Um, gametes across the top. So we have a big Y and a little Y. And then on the side, another big Y and a little Y. Okay. So these are our monohybrids that we're now going to allow to self fertilize. All right. So the, there are four possible zygotes that can be made from the breeding of this, these two individuals. First is capital Y, capital Y. That is our dominant homozygous um, individual. Then we can have a heterozygous individual and a second heterozygous individual. There are two different ways we can generate a heterozygous offspring. Um, and then finally, our fourth potential offspring or possible um, offspring is little y, little y. So that's homozygous recessive. So those are the four potential types um, that we might get. And it depends on which gametes um, combine, all right? It's not, what, what I'm not saying <laughs> is you will not have those four options in every, like, every time you produce offspring. Those are the potential. Those are what you are capable of producing, not what it necessarily is produced, all right? So... Genotype versus phenotype. All right, so we have three different genotypes um, that we can see in this cross. Capital Y, capital Y, that's our um, homozygous dominant. Capital Y, little y, that's our heterozygote. And then little y, little y, our homozygous recessive um, individual. So what are the phenotypes? All right, well, capital Y, capital Y, and capital Y, little y, will always produce yellow seed offspring. And a little y, little y, is going to be um, a green seed, or offspring with green seeds. All right, so let's look again. So when, so this is what we just looked at, right? So when the F1 offspring are crossed with each other, the result is that 25, is it 25%, so a one in four probability of the offspring having capital Y, capital Y genotype, 50% or two in four probability of the offspring having capital Y, little y, and a 25% or one in four probability of the offspring having little y, little y genotype. When counting all four possible outcomes, there's a 75% po probability of the offspring having the yellow phenotype and a 25% probability of the offspring having the green phenotype. Because remember, 
that heterozygote is going to express the dominant phenotype. Um, so that explains the results of Mendel's F2 generation occurring in that three to one um, phenotypic ratio. Um, and here's just another, another visual representation of that. Um, so this Punnett square shows the cross between plants with the yellow seeds and the green seeds, just like the little, the simple little grid one that I did for you. Um, the cross between the two, the true breeding P plants produces those F1 heterozygotes that can be self-fertilized. Um, the self-cross from the F1 generation can be analyzed with the Punnett square to produce the genotypes of the F2 generation. Um, given an inheritance pattern of dominant, recessive, the genotype and genotypic and phenotypic ratios um, can then be determined, right? So that was that you know, genotypes were you know, one in four possibilities, but phenotype um, was one or the other with a three to one ratio. All right, so observing that true breeding pea plants with contrasting traits give rise um, to the F1 generation that all express the dominant trait and the F2 generations that expressed a dominant and recessive traits in that three to one ratio, Mendel proposed what he called the law of segregation. Um, this law states that paired unit factors now called genes, uh, must segregate equally into gametes, such that offspring will have an equal likelihood of inheriting either factor, either factor that their parent possesses. Um, the equal segregation of alleles is the reason we can apply the Punnett square to accurately predict the offspring um, of parents with known genotypes. Okay. Um, the physical basis for Mendel's law of, law of segregation is the first division of meiosis in which the homologous chromosomes with their different versions of each gene are segregated into the daughter nuclei. Um, but remember this process was not understood by the scientific community during Mendel's lifetime and they didn't they couldn't see the implications of of his work. They just just didn't have the they didn't have enough other knowledge at the time. Um, beyond predicting the offspring of a cross between known homozygous and heterozygous parents, Mendel also developed a way to determine whether an organism that expressed a dominant trait was a heterozygote or a homozygote. Um, this technique was called a test cross um, and is still used by plant and animal breeders today. Um, in a test cross, the dominant expressing organism is crossed with an organism that is homozygous recessive for the same trait. Um, if the dominant expressing organism is a homozygote, all of the offspring will express the dominant trait. Alternatively, if the dominant expressing off, uh, organism is a heterozygote, the offspring will exhibit a one-to-one -one ratio um, of heterozygotes uh, and recessive um, homozygote, homozygotes. So, you can see in our little picture, like the, the top one um, shows us, right, if you have, um, you know, you have this heterozygote, or excuse me, you have this, it's, it's homozygous um, for the dominant trait, but you can't tell the difference between homozygous for the dominant trait and heterozygous for the dominant trait, right? They look, they phenotypically, they're going to look the same, but if you breed them to uh, an organism that expresses the recessive trait, if they are homozygous dominant, all the offspring are going to look the same, right? It's just like that monohybrid cross. But if you breed a heterozygote to a homozygous recessive um, organism, you're gonna get that mix again, right? Um, it'll be in a one-to-one -one ratio because this time your homozygous recessive parent um, can only provide the recessive trait. There, there is no dominant copy there. So you get 50-50. All right. All right. So Mendel's law of independent assortment states that genes do not influence each other with regard to sorting of alleles into gametes. And every possible combination of alleles for every gene is equally likely to occur. Um, independent assortment of genes can be illustrated by the dye hybrid cross, a cross between two true breeding parents that express different traits for two characteristics. And these get kind of big. Okay, so consider the characteristics of seed color and seed texture for two pea plants. One that has wrinkled green seeds, 
little r, little r, little y, little y, and another that has round yellow seeds, capital R, capital R, capital Y, capital Y. Uh, because each parent is homozygous, the law of segregation indicates that the gametes for the wrinkled green plants are all little r, little y. And the gametes for all of the round yellow plants are capital R, capital Y. Therefore, the F1 generation of offspring will all be the same, capital R, little r, capital Y, little y. And I realize this is a lot to take in. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll get through it. All right. The gametes produced by the F1 individuals must have one allele from each of the two genes. Okay, so for example, a gamete could get the capital R allele or the little r allele. And so that's your seed shape, texture, and either the capital Y or the little y for the seed color gene. Okay, so the law of independent assortment states that a gamete into which a little r allele is sorted would be equally likely to contain either a capital Y or a little y allele. Uh, thus, there are four equally likely gametes uh, that can be formed when the fully heterozygous, capital R, little r, capital Y, little y, um, is self-crossed. So you're going to have big R, big Y, little r, big Y, big R, little y, little r, little y. <laughs> Uh, don't worry, we've got a picture that we'll look at in a second. Um, arranging these gametes along the top and left of a four by four. So we did a two by two. This is a four by four Punnett square. Um, it's going to give us 16 equally likely genotypic combinations. Um, from these genotypes, we can find a phenotypic ratio of um, nine, let's see, uh, we can find the phenotypic ratio of nine round yellow seeds, three round green seeds, three wrinkled yellow seeds, and one wrinkled green seed. <laughs> um, so nine to three to three to one. Okay. Um, these are the offspring ratios that we would expect uh, assuming we perform the crosses with a large enough sample size. Now, if you do too small of a sample size, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Um, think of it this way. If you have, um, if you have parents that are heterozygous for their eye color, like my husband and I both are heterozygous for our eye color. Um, my mom has blue eyes and my father had brown eyes and my husband's mom has blue eyes and his father had brown eyes. We both have brown eyes. Um, our child has brown eyes, but she had a one in three chance of having, or rather a three to one ratio, one in four chance of having blue eyes because we are both heterozygous. Um, we could have 10 more children and they might all have brown eyes. It, you know, these it's a ratio. We would have to have like 100 offspring before you might start seeing uh, these ratios actual fall, actually fall into place. Um, which was why pea plants were so great and things like humans and dogs are terrible for doing these kinds of experiments with. We just don't make enough offspring. Um, okay, so the physical basis for the law of independent assortment also lies in meiosis one. Okay, so this is where the different homologous pairs line up in random orientations. Each gamete can contain any combination of parental, uh, paternal and maternal chromosomes. Um, and therefore the genes on them because the orientation of the tetrads um, at the metaphase plane is random. It's fully random. Okay. Um, oh, and there's my picture for it. Sorry. Um, so you can see, right, when they, when they line up at the plate, it, it's random where they're going to go. Um, so remember, sometimes people get confused, especially since it's been, you know, that was our previous chapter. Um, meiosis is producing the gamete. It is not producing the zygote. That, that's the next step later. 
So when we're talking about, you know, the sorting of chromosomes, this is all happening to produce the gametes. Um, so a gamete could get, so that, like, how to think about it easier. So the gametes that, say, a purple, that purple pea plant can produce, um, well, let's say it was an F1 generation purple pea plant. Um, it has chromosomes that it inherited from both its, you know, mother and father, plants, whatever. Um, and so it has that full set of chromosomes from each parent. But in its gametes, it might get chromosome one from its mother and chromosome four from its father and chromosome five from its mother. Like it's, the, it's all mixed up. Okay, and if you're like, huh, go back to chapter seven and look back over it a little bit and refresh it in your mind. All right. Uh, thank you for joining me to discuss the laws of inheritance. And again, if you're if you're feeling like, oh, wow, um, I, the meiosis isn't I'm not remembering this stuff. Just go back there. You know, you can pop back to one of my previous videos, um, pull out the OpenStax textbook and just look back over those figures so that you remember what that first you know, when those tetrads line up during, um, at the metaphase plate and how they're going to separate. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing you in our last video for chapter eight.